today's talk is about the, the different ways you've seen people spending like an insane amount of money on cloud databases, and in particular on uh, their Amazon databases. And oftentimes we see that people are actually paying more than they need to for these databases because they haven't made the effort to try to optimize the performance. Um, so this, this idea of people paying more for their databases than, than they actually need uh, is not new. Right? You know it's in the cloud, people had done the same thing in, when it was on-prem. Um, the difference sort of is now is like it's more, there's just more people running in the cloud, more people running databases, uh, and there's only a small number of cloud vendors who's reaping all the benefits of people's uh, sort of laziness. And so to motivate you why I think you should care about improving your database performance to cut down costs, I want to focus on the man in particular that benefits the most from all these unoptimized databases, and that's, of course, Jeff Bezos. So for today's talk, we're going to uh, first start off talking about some obvious things, like you know, uh, obvious things you, everyone should know about in life. Uh, then we'll go over three examples where we've seen people paying, uh, paying more than they need to for, for their databases. And then we'll finish up talking about how we think Otterton can help and giving a quick demo of what Otterton does. So obvious fact number one, databases are hard. Uh, the, you know, this, this is not something new, right? The databases are super important. They're part of every major application stack, um, but they have a lot of facets or a lot of components and features to them that are difficult for humans to reason about and try to optimize. And so as people are moving to the, to the cloud now, what we see is that they just keep throwing money at the cloud vendors uh, to increase their, their hardware spend or the, the resources allocated to these databases rather than maybe trying to fix some underlying problems. And they do this because the cloud vendors make this really, really easy. And so one alternative would be in the, in the, you know, in the old days would be you have a, a human DBA, like an expert in a database system who knew the ins and outs, knew how the application was trying to use the database system. They would be, they would be responsible for actually trying to optimize the system and make it perform more efficiently. But the challenge is, of course, that DBAs are, are not cheap. Um, so this is a study done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on the average salary of a DBA in the United States. And you can see in, in 2019, it was around $96,000 a year. Again, this is the average across the entire United States. Certainly on the East Coast and West Coast, uh, the salaries are, are much higher. Um, but of course, these are, this is not a scalable solution. If you have hundreds of databases, you can't hire a DBA for every single one. And DBA is often doing a bunch of other things other than just trying to optimize you know, the performance of the system. They're doing backup recovery plans, doing uh, you know, reporting. There's a, they're doing a bunch of other stuff and maybe not have, may not have the time to try to optimize the system. And also too, in, in sort of modern tech companies, the traditional role of DBAs is sort of going away. Now it's all sort of this falls under the umbrella of DevOps, where whatever person who set up my SQL Postgres or the database at their last job, they draw the short straw and they're responsible for setting up the database uh, at the new job. But again, they're not, they're not database experts, they just sort of know something about it. So databases are hard, that's an obvious fact. The next obvious fact is that Jeff Bezos is rich, like you know, ridiculously rich. Uh, so even after his divorce from his wife uh, earlier, uh, very recently, he's still the second richest man in the world, losing out to Elon Musk. Um, you know, he's still worth whatever two hundred billion dollars, uh, and it, you know, just give you an idea how much money he, this man is making. Uh, he makes two point five billion dollars a week, right? Not million, right? Billion per week. I think it comes down to like three thousand dollars per second. Um, you know, needs to say, you know, this man has, been, has a lot of money, and a sizable portion of his fortune or his money is coming from Amazon Web Services or AWS. Um, so it wasn't until very recently that Amazon actually split out the how much money the corporation is making versus like from the store and other ventures versus the uh, AWS. Right? It used to be they just combined everything together, and you didn't know you didn't you, you didn't get a good idea how much they were getting from the cloud stuff. Um, but in, in their recent you know 2021 financial reports that are public, they state that 54% of the operating income of the of the company is coming from the AWS division. Right, so this is a lot of money that people are making, or that Amazon's making, and therefore, you know, Jeff Bezos is, is making. And a large portion of this AWS revenue or, or operating income for Amazon 
is coming from people uh, deploying databases using Amazon's relational database service, RDS. Um, it's not the, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of other things that other, other products and services that Amazon provides, but RDS is what we're focused on today. And it's, it's a, certainly a, a lot people are spending with this. So this is just a little leaderboard we've been tracking internally at OtterTune about how much people are spending on RDS for some of our customers. And so the most expensive single database that we've come across was around $48,000 a year, sorry, $48,000 a month. Uh, and this is just for a Postgres database. The highest total cost we spent, we see someone spend on all RDS products was about a uh, million dollars a month. And this is after going, you know, negotiating and, and pay, you know, getting a discount through Amazon through, you know, bulk purchases or, or reserved instances. And then the highest percentage we've seen of people spending on their total Amazon bill or RDS bill or AWS bill, uh, and then what portion of that goes to, to RDS was about 56%. So someone's a AWS bill, 56% of it is being spent on, on RDS. So needless to say, that, again, this is a lot of money people are spending on their databases, um, and we think a large portion of this doesn't actually need to be paid to him uh, because you know, people are just running unoptimized systems. So I'm going to go through now three examples or three different scenarios or situations where we've come across where people are clearly paying jet visas more for their databases than, than they actually need to. Okay, so the first problem is that people are running with a larger instance size than they actually need. So when you deploy a database, uh, you know, if it's either it's on-prem or in the cloud, you obviously need to know or anticipate how much hardware you're actually going to need for it. So when you deploy the database in RDS, you're given a bunch of different choices where you can you can decide like what kind of CPU you want, like you know is it ARM versus Intel, the number of of, of cores or vCPUs you get, the amount of RAM. Usually that's tied to the number of cores, uh, but they have different instance types that are memory optimized versus compute optimized. And then you have to specify the the amount of storage, the storage type, and the bandwidth, or the, the performance you want of that, right? So it's 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 not different than if, when you are running on-prem because you'd have to do procurement and figure all these things out. The difference is that you can get this hardware instantaneously, whereas if you're getting it on-prem, you got to call a vendor and they have to ship it in. Right? It takes it takes a long time. So it's really easy to fire up these databases, but you have to make this choice about what hardware you want to use. And with so many different possible choices, it's not. This is not really something that humans can, can easily reason about and understand what they should actually be using for the particular database. So I'm showing you here, this is this, just for like on Postgres RDS or MySQL RDS, here's all the different categories of CPU RAM configurations that you could possibly have. And again, it, to make this, make an educated choice is, is really, really hard for this. Now, if it's a brand new application and you don't have any data, this is easy because you pick the cheapest one, right? Because you, you know, they're not taxing the system yet. Um, if you're coming from an on-prem deployment and, and migrating to the cloud, then you usually pick the, you know, the, an, an instance type that is instance size that has roughly around the same amount of RAM and, and CPU. The challenge, of course, is that over time, as your, your database grows or the application changes and you need to make changes and upgrade maybe the instance size, that's when people start to have problems. So, as I said, they make it really easy for you to, to change the instance size. Uh, and it's not just Amazon, all the major cloud vendors support this kind of, uh, these changes. But basically you can say, I wanna go from this, I have your current instance size, and you wanna to migrate to a new one, and you can either specify to do that immediately. Of course, the problem there is it oftentimes requires a restart, and you know that you may not wanna do that right away, especially in the middle of the day when you're trying to serve your customers. Um, but you know, the most common approach is to say, I wanna do my restart when I have a, some later point when I have a maintenance window. Right, Amazon sometimes requires you to do a restart at your specified maintenance window. They do that when they want to do uh, upgrade your version of, of you know of the database system you're using. So how do you figure out whether you're running the right instance size or not? Well, the cloud vendors provide these tools, uh, these monitoring tools like CloudWatch, or you can use some of the open source ones like Percona's uh, monitoring service, where they can provide you some indication that your system performance is. Uh, is lower than it should be, or it's not getting, it's, it's degrading over time um, due to insufficient hardware resources. And so when this occurs, it's up to you as the human to figure out, okay, it looks like I need to do something. Let me figure out what instance size to use next. So a common pattern we see is that people observe through these monitoring services that their, their system is running slow because they're CPU bound or they've exhausted the amount of memory. 
So then they pick a new instance size. It's usually just clicking, going up the next tier uh, and, and, you know, and then restarting the system and getting, getting that benefit. And usually, you know, for most cases, you could see uh, some of the smaller tiers, the smaller instance sizes, you'll see a, you, know, you, you should see a performance improvement. Um, but the challenge, of course, is that these, app, these database systems aren't static. Things change, things evolve. And nobody ever goes back and checks to see whether they should be going down to instance size. Uh, and so that means you're just paying for more money than they actually need. Or in other cases, we've seen people blindly just keep bumping up the instance size, assuming that's going to solve the problem. Uh, and if it doesn't, again, they, they rarely ever go back to the instance size. Um, so to give you an idea of how much it's going to cost and, and what the, uh, the performance limitations or benefits you can get from increasing your instance size, we're going to run a simple experiment here where we take Postgres running on RDS, uh, and we're going to run the TPCC workload, which is the standard operational benchmark everyone uses for sort of transaction processing systems. And we're going to run that uh, on different on the same database on different instance sizes. So the workload in the database is the same, going from one instance size to the next. We're just going to measure how fast we can get the system to run as we increase the hardware resources available. So along the x-axis, you see that we're scaling up the instance size. Uh, and you see when we hit M5 at 8x large, uh, we plateau. And we get roughly around 1,900 to 2,000 transactions a second. Um, and going anything beyond that is, doesn't, doesn't yield any improvement. right? And this is because the, for, the, for this given workload, we might be saturating or using all the, the resources we actually need up to this point. So adding more cores, adding more uh, or more RAM doesn't make a difference because like, the database maybe already fits in memory. Um, or there may be other issues in the, at a sort of logical level, like transactions conflicting and so forth. There, just giving more cores doesn't doesn't help anything. It won't make things better for us. So this is the best we can get for the particular workload on N5 8x large, uh, but the price difference certainly is is, is quite quite different uh, going beyond that, right? So this, this box will co cost you roughly $25,000 a year, but if you go all the way to the M5 24X large, it's $75,000 a year. But again, you're paying $50,000 a year extra, but you're not getting actually any benefit. So it's this region here, this is, the, this is where Jeff Bezos is, is, is laughing at you because just he's getting more money for not having to do anything and you're not getting any benefits and you're clearly overpaying for your database. So what does he do with all this extra money that he's making from you overpaying for your instance size that you don't actually need? Um, well, you know, he's a billionaire, so, so he's got to do the sort of the classic billionaire things. And so the first thing he's going to do is buy a bunch of houses, a bunch of real estate all throughout the United States and around the world. So he has, you know, he has a, a mansion in, in Beverly Hills. He's got his lakeside mansion up in Seattle. This is his second lakeside mansion. This is the one he bought next. Um, then I guess the, the Beverly Hills one wasn't big enough, so he bought another mansion across the street from, from the first one. So that was, at the time, that was the most expensive house, I think, in California. But I think he actually lost that title this week. Someone bought something else. I forget who it was, but they, he lost that title. But it's, I think it's the most expensive house still in, in LA. And of course, he's got his, uh, you know, he's, he's got his, his lavish apartments in, in, in New York City, right? So the one city where he was he was missing a mansion was was uh, Washington D.C. So he bought the largest house you can buy or that was available, actually the largest house that exists in in Washington D.C. Uh, and for this one, he paid twenty three million dollars for it. Um, but again, there's this pattern where he buys a house doesn't feel like it's big enough, and so he buys like a, a companion house or a house nearby. Uh, so it, it reportedly very recently. He actually bought another mansion across the street from the, the, the first mansion. This one is obviously not as big, uh, but so this second mansion cost him $5 million. So in total, his two DC residents were $28 million. And again, this is all paid for by people paying for more than, you know, using larger instance sizes than they actually need for RDS. All right. So the next problem we see are, is, is similar to the instance size issue where people are, are paying more for provision IOPS than, than they actually need in the data system. So they're paying for the storage capacity of the system and the bandwidth uh, beyond what they, actually, excuse me, what they actually need. So it's sort of obvious why a database system needs storage and you want fast storage, um, but it's, it's more than just you know, storing data and, and, and running queries. Like, it's more than just trying to service select queries and insert queries, updates, and deletes. 
the database system is going to do a bunch of other things in the background to make sure the data is safe, make sure that it's uh, that you know it can it can perform efficiently for the operations of the queries that it's asked to do. So in addition to reading writing data for queries, the data system has other components like the write ahead log, the write you know uh, records out the disk, make sure that they're saved after a crash. You can take save points to store intermediate data. Checkpoints in the background writer is, is writing on dirty pages to disk. Uh, for multi-versioning in Postgres, they have this thing called the, the auto vacuum or the vacuum. It's basically doing like, like garbage collection. This is specific to Postgres. Um, MySQL and Oracle and other systems do multi-versioning a different way. You don't need the you don't need the, the garbage collector or the vacuum. And also too, if you're running a query and it has a lot of data that doesn't fit in memory, it can spill to disk as, as, as a temp buffer. Right, so it's more than just writing, you know, reading, writing data for, you know, that, that are in my like tables. There's a whole bunch of other things going on in the system that need, that relies on having fast storage. So the overall performance of the system of a database system is dependent on how fast you can read and write. Right, if it's, you have a really slow slow disk, then the system is going to seem unresponsive and queries are going to take a long time. So. When you deploy a new instance uh, in RDS, you have to make a choice about what kind of storage you want to use. Same way you had to choose what kind of, uh, you know, what, what kind of, how many CPU cores and amount of memory you wanted. So your two choices are to do uh, what they call the general purpose SSD storage um, or the provision IOPS. So for the general purpose one, this is like the sort of the lowest tier of, of performance uh, storage for RDS. Um, and the the bandwidth you get for or the speed you get from reading and writing to disk to, to storage depends on the size of your, your your allocated storage. So if I say I have a 100 gigabyte database, then Amazon will give me three times 100 or 300 IOPS, uh, you, know, you know, for my, for my database. And so if I increase that number or I decrease it, then that changes my IOPS. They also have this other thing too, which is sort of tricky for people to understand, uh, where they can have these temporary boosts, or the bursts they call them, where they'll increase the 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 IOPS you're getting to storage uh, temporarily. Um, so the basic way it works is they give you like a credit uh, that that you're accruing over time, and if you ever need to go beyond your your default allocation of three times the number of uh, three times the number of gigabytes you have. Then they can temporarily speed up your performance to storage, uh, you know, for you know, for for some operations that occur every so often. So the idea is that they're not guaranteeing you performance, uh, you know, high performance all the time, but the you know, every so often, if you actually need it, you can get it. And again, these credits accrue over time, and you keep accumulating them. But of course, when you exhaust your credits for the burst burst traffic, then you fall back to your your default minimal uh, performance. So again, for for Low volume or low activity databases, this is fine. Uh, it's the, it's obviously if you're trying to run something in production with a lot of users and a lot of traffic, you don't want to rely on this because all of a sudden if you exhaust your burst credits, then you, you know then your performance is going to tank, and that's obviously bad. So most people that are care care about the performance of their system running in production are going to choose to use provision IOPS, where you can specify or you can pay Amazon. To guarantee a specific uh, performance for storage, uh, no matter what, and so it's not a credit system. It's just like saying I, I want this guaranteed, uh, you know, guaranteed minimum performance. And so it's a use it or lose it approach. It's not like the credits where you can accumulate them and roll them over if you don't from one day to the next. It's if you're paying for 5,000 IOPS and you don't use it, you know, th this given hour, the next hour, you know, you you, you can't use 10,000, right? The other in interesting thing about this is that, unlike instance size, which in theory you can change, you know, one, you know, over and over again. Uh, of course, you have to restart the database, which may, you probably, you know, most people don't want to do. With the IOPS, the provision IOPS, you don't actually have to restart the database system because it's done sort of at the net network control plane or network plane. Um, but they only let you change it every three hours. Of course, the problem is nobody ever actually tweaks this, uh, you know, over and over again throughout the day because nobody has the time to do that. So a common pattern that we see is that people find that again through their monitoring service that they feel like the database is running slow because 
they're exceeding the, the, the IOPS that they've already provisioned, right? They're doing more read, read write operations than what, what they've allocated. Um, so they just bump this up, pay Amazon more uh, and get the better performance and then just kick the can down the road and don't try to solve all the problems. Assume that this is just, you know, keep giving Amazon money, I'll worry about this later. Of course that, like, like in this instance size, this has diminishing returns because I can only increase the provision IOPS so far where until my database doesn't actually need it. And in some cases, it may actually not be solving the, the real problem, uh, which we'll get to in a second. So for this study, we're gonna run the same workload and the same configuration that I had before, but now I'm gonna run on the same instance size, but now scale up and increase the amount of provision IOPS that we're allocating to this database instance. Against the same TPCC workload with 200 warehouses and the same 50, 50 terminals. So just like before, what you see is that up to a certain point, if I keep giving the database system more and more provision IOPS, it's going to plateau right around 10,000, and that no matter how much IOPS, more IOPS I give it, I'm not going to get any better performance because the database system just simply doesn't need it. It doesn't there's, it's, for this given workload, it doesn't need more uh, storage performance uh, or bandwidth, right? It's 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 exhausted it. Right? The bottom that could be something up in the system. It could be maybe maybe we have, we have the wrong instance size. Could be something with the, the concurrent control, could be my queries, could be the configuration, right? Beyond this point, it, it, we're not getting a, any benefit. And so we see this pretty often. We see people like have jacked this up because they had a spike at some point and they increased the provision IOPS, but then that spike was transit or ephemeral and they don't go back and actually change it. And they're, so they're ever paying for more than they need. So to give you an idea how much this is gonna cost you, the provision IOPS actually costs way more than in the instant size. Uh, this is, you know, compared to what you get from the like EDS, uh, I think Amazon charges like a 2X or 3X premium over, if you have an EDS volume and you want, when you, and you want provision IOPS, if it's, if it's RDS provision IOPS, they charge more for this because they know they have a captured audience. So again, the, for the, for the 10,000 provision IOPS, this is going to cost you roughly $20,000 a year. But if you go up to the 80,000 provision IOPS, which for uh, my SQL and Postgres is the, 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 the highest setting that Amazon lets you have, you're paying roughly around $180,000 a year. So it is a lot, a lot of money. And again, this region here is the Jeff Bezos laughing zone because you know, you're paying for more than, than you actually need. So what does he do with all this provision IOPS money? So again, he's a billionaire. You already have the, you already have all the properties. You already have the lavish mansions. What do you do next? You buy a super yacht. Right, so the purported uh, purchase price of Jeff Bezos' super yacht, which is not out yet, or it's not, it's not finished, they're still building it, is half a billion dollars, $500 million. Um, but what makes this really interesting for a super yacht is that it's not actually gonna be the largest super yacht in the world, right? So this super yacht he's building, I think it's only 127 meters long. I think the, the world record is like 190, maybe 200 meters. Right, so it's not the largest in terms of all super yachts, but it is going to be the largest super yacht uh, that's a sailboat. So, so most super yachts, again, the, the, the really large ones have engines. This one is going to be actually powered by sails. So there's not a photo of it being completed yet. This actually photo came out uh, last month. This is the, the, his super yacht yet to be named, uh, being moved from the shipyard in Amsterdam out closer to, to the ocean. Um, and again, it's a sailboat. You can see where the, the masts are right here, but you can't actually see, you know, they haven't, they haven't installed them yet. So there's, again, there's no picture or, rent, or, or render of what it's actually gonna look like, but it's actually gonna be very similar to what used to be the, uh, what, what currently is and won't be after this thing comes out, uh, the world's largest sailing super yacht uh, called the Black Pearl. So it's gonna roughly look, look something like this. Um, but there's a big problem that Jeff Bezos has. When you go with a sailboat super yacht, uh, the trouble is, how do you get to it? Because um, you know most billionaires travel in helicopters when they want to get someplace real quickly, uh, and that's like local. But the problem is with this sailboat is that you can't you can't fly a helicopter to land on it because you would hit the sails and crash, right? So this is a big problem. How you know how do you get a helicopter to to, to your super yacht? And the solution is, if you're a billionaire, is that you buy another super yacht that follows along your first one uh, that has a helipad that allows you to, to land on it. Um, so this is a render of what, what Jeff Bezos' super yacht, sort of, it's called a shadow vessel or 
friend super yacht, I don't know. Uh, so this super yacht is, is only 75 meters, whereas the, the bigger one is 127. Um, the, because I looked this up, in order to be classified as a super yacht, you gotta be 40 meters. So this new, the second one here is, is, um, is, is, is you know, 75 meters, so that's enough. So again, this has the helipad, it can handle 40 people in this. And so the idea is that you, you take the helipad to this thing, this super yacht, and then you, there's a little boat that takes you over to the, to the main super yacht. So again, this is what he has to deal with you know, in, in his life. You need, your boat needs another boat to get to the boat. Um, so there's no public price on this, this the shadow super yacht, um, but the, the one that was sold to another billionaire that was very similar was about $50 million. So again, all those provision IOP money you're paying for in AWS for your RDS databases that you're not actually needing or using, it's paying for Jeff Bezos' second backup boat for his main boat. Okay. So the, the last one I want to talk about is people running with the, the default configuration. Um, and so the, the configuration of the database system is, is refers to uh, these knobs that you can tweak to change the runtime behavior of the system. So every data system has the, these knobs. They call, sometimes call them different things. So in Postgres, they call them setting parameters. In MySQL, they call them uh, system variables. And they're basically these, uh, these knobs that, that, that are exposed to you as the administrator, the user, that allow you to change the runtime behavior of the system for the internal components of the database. So these are like buffer pool sizes, memory buffer sizes, caching sizes, caching policies, uh, other tweaks to different features of, of, of the system itself. Uh, like in Postgres, you can tweak the behavior of the auto vacuum. You can enable JIP compilation with LLVM. In MySQL, you can turn off features, turn on features on and off like the adaptive hash index. Right? Every system has their, has their own set of unique knobs. Um, of course, the challenge is that there's a lot of them, and a lot of them can affect the performance, uh, and it's up to you to figure out how to, how to, how to set them correctly to, to make your system run as optimal as it possibly could. And the reason why they exist is because when the database system developer was building the database system, at some point they had to make a decision about how to allocate memory for a hash table or something. Um, and then rather than putting a pound to find in the source code and assume that's gonna be good enough for everyone, they instead expose it as a knob because they assume that at some later point, an administrator or a user who knows how the application wants to use the database system will be in a better position to set that knob correctly. Because again, there's a lot of these knobs and, and nobody's really an expert in all of them in, in these systems. It's that's not a reasonable expectation. So to give you an idea how bad the problem actually is, so this is a survey we did where we just looked at the last 20 year release history of Postgres and MySQL, the two most popular open source databases. And for every release, we just looked at the documentation and we counted the number of knobs that, that they had. And you see at, at the beginning of the century, both Postgres and MySQL had less than 100. But then 20 years later, MySQL grew by 7x and Postgres grew by 5x. Now, not all these knobs will actually affect performance in the way that I'm talking about up here, right? Some of these knobs are file names and, and directories and port numbers, right? They're things that you don't actually want to tune to change the behavior of the system for performance reasons or efficiency reasons. They're things you need to set once to make sure the system actually works correctly at all. But there's still enough of them uh, that can have a dramatic difference in performance. Um, and it's really important that people actually try to set these things. So what does Amazon do? So Amazon has actually done some basic tuning for, for the knobs when you deploy an RDS instance. So it's, it's better than the default configuration you get from like the OS package maintainers, uh, like if you call app get install MySQL, um, you know, that's, that you get the default configuration that MySQL generates. And it's, 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 it's very conservative. Like MySQL assumes you're running on a box with 160 megabytes of RAM, right? And obviously in 2021, that doesn't make any sense. Um, because, you know, they're trying to just not have, you know, they don't want to make assumptions about what the, the hardware that they're going to get, get deployed on, um, because they assume some, some administrators can be able to set that correctly. So, Amazon has already done some basic tuning uh, for each hardware instance size to set it to roughly what it would, you know, what they think is the right thing. But again, it's general purpose. Uh, it's not actually tuned for any of the application that's running on it. It's just be, you know, it's, it's the sort of lowest common denominator across all possible applications that could be used in the database system. Of course, the problem is that people don't know that they should be tuning these knobs. 
Uh, and we've actually had people tell us, surprisingly, they're very knowledgeable people that are you know, running uh, you, know, you know, in charge of databases, but again, and as a DevOps person, not a, not a DBA, they told us that they assumed that Amazon had already set these knobs correctly. Because in some cases, the knobs have, you can, in Amazon lets you define as formulas based on the hardware configuration. Uh, so they, they think somehow Amazon has set some of these things correctly for every single uh, application. And, and it's obviously not the case. So what do we, the pattern we see of people struggle with is that there's some change in the database. Uh, it's either they've, um, you know, the application adds new features, they've added a bunch of new tables, a bunch of new data. Um, just the, you know, the workload has changed, the database itself has changed, um, but nobody ever goes back and updates the knobs. If you change the instance size, then Amazon will give you the configuration for the next, you know, next instance size. Um, but again, it's not tuned exactly for how your application is going to use the database system. So the database changes, nobody updates the knobs, performance degrades over time, right? Because the system is running uh, more efficiently or inefficiently. Um, so this is queries are running slower. You're seeing larger bloat in your tables. I right? think everything's just getting worse and you're just, you're just throwing your money away at this point. Right? If you're not tuning your, your, your data system configuration for these knobs, for every single individual application that's running on them or running every data that you're actually running, then you, you might as well just write a, a, a personal check to Jeff Bezos because you know, he's just laughing at you because this is, this is just clearly a stupid thing to do. So to give an idea how much better you can get, if the performance be how much better performance you can get, if you tune the knobs for exactly how the application is going to run on the database system, we're going to run that same TPCC workload that I've shown before. And this time we're going to run it on the same instance size for Postgres and MySQL. And we're going to start with the default configuration that Amazon gives you with RDS. And again, they've already tuned it somewhat beyond what the, 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 very, you know, the default configuration is from the, the package maintainers. But then we're going to use the, the auto-tune service to actually come up with an optimized configuration that's tuned exactly for how the application wants to use the database or is using the database. So you see in the case of Postgres, we can get uh, over 2x better performance. Again, same workload, same hardware, same everything, just we've changed some configuration knobs. In the case of MySQL, uh, we can get almost over 4x better. Again, same, same database system, same version, same workload, same hardware, uh, and just through tuning these configuration knobs, we can do much better. So again, Bezos is laughing if you're using default config, and surprisingly, a lot of people still are. So, what are people? You know, what is Jeff Bezos doing with all this money? Well, again, we've already covered the the, the 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 real estate and the houses and the mansions. We've already covered his super yacht. So at that point, like, you know, what do you do next? Now he's got the the Blue Origin stuff. He's got the space thing. Uh, admittedly, that's kind of cool. And if I was a billionaire, I would probably do the same thing. So I'm not I'm not going to knock that. Uh, but like again, it's like, what do you get? What do you get the person who already has everything? So what does he do? He builds a uh, a, a clock inside of a mountain that will last ten thousand years and only ticks once per year. Um, so this is called the clock of the long now. Um, it's actually a it's a, uh, a an actual implementation of a theoretical clock that a scientist designed in the late nineteen eighties. And I guess Jeff Bezos got bored with his money or whatever, and he decided to go ahead and build it. So it's being built down in a in a mountain that he owns down in Texas. I don't think you can you can physically go there, uh, and I don't know I don't think it, this is operational yet. But this is real. There's videos are showing that it, you know people are actually working on this and building this thing. Uh, and again, it's supposed to last for 10,000 years, but only tick once per year. So this clock costs Jeff Bezos 42 million dollars. Um, Again, I would say you know, this is all being paid for by people using the default config and running their database system uh, you know, in, in an inefficient manner on RDS. All right, so we want to focus on this last problem, right? If you want to, if you want to say, okay, picking the right instance size, that's a hard problem. Like capacity planning is hard. Provision IOPS, that's, that's challenging too because you don't know what maybe it's coming in the future, right? It's, it's maybe hard to plan that as well. But let's focus on, on database configuration knobs and try to tune those and see, you know, see if we can get that benefit that we showed before. So how, how do people do this today? You essentially have four choices. First is you DIY it, you do it yourself. Uh, and again, this is typically somebody who you own your team in a DevOps role who you know, set up MySQL the last job, so they're setting up MySQL for you this time. And all they're really gonna do is just Google 
how to tune, you know, you know, whatever database system you're trying to set up. And you're going to find a bunch of these blog articles that give you some general tips of how to tune, the, tune these knobs. And usually it's, it's maybe four, maybe five knobs that everyone recommends how to tune. Um, and truth be told, Amazon has probably already tuned, tuned them the same way that these, that these blog articles uh, specify. But again, it's general purpose. It's not targeting the application in, in, in the exact workload that's trying to use the database. Uh, and in some cases, we actually found these, sometimes these blog articles give incorrect advice. Uh, like we'll say enable one particular feature, or turn, tune the knob this way. And then in some of the workloads or deployments we've done of AutoTune, we've seen that the exact opposite is true, right? Because again, it's, they don't know how the app, you know, these are general blog advice. They don't know how, how the application is actually using the database. All right, so say if you don't want to DIY it, uh, the other approach is to hire DBA. But as I already said, those people are becoming more rare these days. Um, and if you usually hire them, they're doing a bunch of other stuff, maybe don't have time to do knob tuning, um, and they're obviously very expensive. Um, so, it, you know, this is a solution, but it's, 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 not, it's not something everybody can choose. So the next approach is to use these sort of rule-based tools where you, you provide some basic information, like I have this amount of RAM, you know, this, 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 many, this number of CPU cores, this amount of disk. And they use some hard-coded formulas that spit out some basic recommendations on how to, how, you know, how to tune a small number of knobs. So for Postgres, there's a website called PGTune. There's another one called PGConf that essentially works the same way. Um, and for MySQL, it's called MySQL Tuner. Uh, the PGTune is, is this hard-coded formulas. MySQL Tuner, you actually run and connect to the database and retrieves a bunch of, a bunch of internal metrics and makes recommendations. But at a high level, it's, it's working the same way with as much if-then else statements that say how to, how to set different parameters. And this is what Amazon sort of does for some things already. Um, and we'll see in a second, we actually can beat these, again, because these are just, again, it's maybe slightly better than the blogs, because it is taking account for what your database is actually trying to do. Um, but it's not, you know, it doesn't have a precise view of what, how the data system is actually being used to make the best recommendations. And again, they only support a, a limited number of knobs. So what I'm arguing today and what AutoTune is all about is that we want to rely on machine learning to, uh, to, to come up with optimal configurations for every single database that's out there, rather than try to come up you know, to general purpose rules uh, that work good enough for, for some things, uh, but not all. We think with, with something machine learning that since you don't have to have a human, you don't have to rely on you know, developer devi devising these rules, you can, get the best, you can get the best configurations to get the best performance. So AutoTune is just that. So AutoTune is a automated database tuning and resource optimization service. And the core idea is that we're going to use machine learning to observe how the application is going to use the database. And then we're going to feed that into our algorithms to then generate uh, configurations that we think will actually improve performance or improve the efficiency of the system. And to do this, as we'll see in a second, the only thing we need to collect from the system itself is just these metrics that the database system and the environment generate for you are all, that they're already generating now. So the data system generates internal metrics or term telemetry that's used for these monitoring services like pages read, pages held, you know, pages read, pages written, locks held, and so forth. Uh, and these are meant to be for human DBAs to look at and to diagnose performance issues. And then for sort of OS level uh, telemetry, this is like, CV utilization, memory usage, you know, you know, disk reads and writes, right? So you can get this from Amazon CloudWatch or, or, or Prometheus or whatever, whatever monitoring service you're using. It's all the same stuff. So that means we, with AutoTune, we don't actually need to, to make any changes to the application code to collect this information. And we don't, need, don't require you to install uh, you know, special extensions or plugins into the database system to collect this stuff. It's all running through sort of standard SQL APIs or in case of RDS, uh, you go through CloudWatch and you know, their standard APIs. And so this also means that we don't need to see any of the queries, and we don't want to need to see any of the, the user tables, any of the user data. And so there's no like, privacy concerns. We've done major deployments in, in Europe, and they have GDPR you know, restrictions. Their InfoSec people looked at what we were doing and decided that there was no, you know, no privacy or security concerns, because you know, page of read, page of written, is, nobody cares about that. So, the current version of AutoTune supports Postgres and MySQL. Uh, on the ac academic side, we've, we've also done deployments with Oracle and, uh, and some other, other systems. And then the current version that's public available today is supports Amazon RDS. Both like the, for RDS, the, 
like the, the, the vanilla versions of Postgres and MySQL, as well as the Aurora optimized ones. Um, they call it Aurora RDS versus regular RDS, but whatever, the, I think everyone knows what I mean. And this is, this is something that we've been working on for, for six or seven years uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. And in the last year, uh, my students and I have spun it off as, as a startup because you know, for the last couple of years, people keep emailing us and said, hey, we have this exact problem. Can we give you money to fly a student out, set up AutoTune for us? And we've never been in a position to, to do that kind of thing until now we, we spun out as a startup. Uh, again, try to make this available to everyone. So the way AutoTune works is that you have your target database that you want to tune. Uh, you come to our service, you provide uh, the credentials to access the, the database system with minimal permissions just to read the configuration information and, and these metrics. You don't have to give us permissions to look at user, user data or any uh, queries themselves, which can contain some sensitive information. And then the, uh, you then deploy a agent uh, as a Docker file so in Amazon, uh, you can deploy this with Fargate, or you can download our Docker file and, and run it yourself in your own Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster. And the agent is going to connect to the database and retrieve the, the current metrics and the last configuration, the current configuration of the system. Again, using standard APIs, we don't require any additional plugins or, 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 or middleware to retrieve this, this data. We then send that information back to AutoTune's repository running in AWS, along with all the other training data we collected from other tuning other database systems. We then feed this into our compute engine that trains a statistical model that can predict how the data system's behavior will change as you start making changes to configuration ops. So you tell us, I want to optimize throughput, I want to optimize latency, I want to reduce my, my, my disk writes and disk reads. Um, and Autotune then can train a machine learning model that can try to predict if you change the knobs a certain way, would that improve or, or hurt the performance of the, the thing you're trying to optimize? And then we use these models to uh, recommend a new configuration that we think will improve performance. We send that back over to the agent who then installs it um, on the data system and then repeats the process over and over again. So we make a change and then observe what, whether, whether it's helping or not. And over time, the models can then can converge and we think, you know, we come back to you and say, hey, we think we have uh, the optimal configuration for you right, right now. So I'm going to show two quick uh, additional benchmarks we've done with TPCC again, and then we'll kick it off with a, a quick demo to show you just how easy it is to set up. So this is running TPCC again on RDS for Postgres, uh, but now we're going to actually have two instance sizes with, 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 with two different levels of provision IOPS. So the first one is going to be M5 4X large. So this is 60, uh, 16 CP CPUs with 64 gigs of RAM. But we set it with 4,000 provision IOPS. And then the second one is going to be uh, M52X large, so half, more, half the number of CPUs, half the amount of RAM, and also with half the provision IOPS. And so the first main takeaway is that if you just stick within the same hardware category configuration, we see AutoTune can, uh, again, get getting 2X, 2x better or 4X better performance than, uh, or no, sorry, 2X better performance for, for, for this instance size and 2X better for this instance size as well. And then the blue line here is one of those rule-based uh, tuners that I mentioned before. In this case here, it's PG Tune, and you can see that AutoTune is, is outperforming that quite quite a bit as well. Um, but so again, within the same hardware configuration, we can get double performance. But now, if, what's interesting, if you look across hardware configurations, you see that on the cheaper machine with AutoTune's optimized configuration, we get the same performance that you're getting on the more expensive machine using Amazon's default configuration. So the price difference is for these guys is, is about half. So on this machine here it costs costs half as much as this one, and we and we can get you the same performance as you were getting on the more expensive one if you just get just using the default. So we see the same benefit on MySQL. Again, same two uh, instance sizes and the same two different levels of, uh, of provision IOPS. And again, on the same instance size for MySQL, we can get over four x better on this larger machine. And then um, it's 5x better on the on the smaller machine. But again, across the, the two instance sizes and provision IOPS levels, on the cheaper machine, we can get actually double the performance of what you can get on the more expensive machine. And again, it costs half as much. So this one is about $7,000 a year. This one is, is $14,000. So this is kind of nice. Again, so with Autogen, you can actually make a choice and say, you know, am I going to get better performance to stick with the same hardware level? or 
can I downgrade and pay less to Amazon, pay less to, less to Jeff Bezos without sacrificing all performance? But actually, in this case, in, in MySQL, you're actually going to get better performance as well. All right, so let's kick this off with a quick live demo, just sharing you how to set up Autotune for your database. Um, for, so for this, refreshing this. Maybe I should, I should not. Let me do that. I will do duplicate. Okay, I'm still sharing, right? So let me hide this. All right, so we're going to create a new database. Um, we specify that we're doing Postgres. Um, and then I have a bunch of additional things I want to share here. So we're going to call this machine database demo. And we are in US East 2, I think. And then our Dave's nickname, we'll just call this um, Andy Demo. So what's going to happen here is that uh, at this point here, Autotune is going to connect to AWS, make sure that there's a database that exists uh, in, this, in this region with this, um, with this database identifier. And then we'll begin the process of deciding how we actually then want to deploy the agent and connect to the system so that we can retrieve the metrics, retrieve the configuration uh, you know, from the system and begin the, the tuning process. So for this one, we're going to deploy with, with Fargate. Um, I don't need to show how it works, but basically you click this button, you punch in some basic information uh, about the you know, security information for the system, and then that will go ahead and uh, you know, deploy the, 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 the agent in, in Amazon Fargate that connects to the database, and that, that works as a, the, the, the conduit to, so the auditing service can get data in and out and make changes. So we'll go ahead and click Done for that. Um, and then so we can go into this. And so it hasn't connected yet, uh, but we'll, we can come back to that later and show that it actually does work. But as, as always, like when you want to give a live demo, We already have one that, that, that's already working. Um, so for this one, I'll go back here. So again, these are the two data that I set up before. So these are the, it's the, it's the same experiment I had before where I had two different databases for Postgres on two different instance sizes. And we want to show that if Autotune tunes one and leaves the other one with the default configuration that Amazon gives you, how much better performance we can get. So we can see in this one here, we're getting around uh, 2,000 transactions a second. Um, and you can see that within over time, uh, how the performance has, has changed. Um, and we, we can see what changes uh, Autotune made to the configuration by comparing, th by comparing this configuration uh, with a previous one. And it just shows you what parameters actually actually got, got changed and what, what the values got changed to. And then we can go under performance charts, uh, I click three days. Uh, custom on this, sorry, Tuesday. That's a little, it's small, it's hard to see, but uh, the, the peak performance for in the, the modern configuration, the modeling uh, data system was around 1500 transactions a second, but with, with the auto tune tuning it, um, it got up to, to what is that one? Roughly around 2,500. So we're getting a thousand transactions a second more, um, you know, running on, on, a, on, a, on a cheaper machine. So, okay. Um, with that, extend. Oh, I didn't like that. Okay. Let me try to get this back. We're basically done. Uh, so just to finish up quickly, um, the <laughs> Jeff Bezos is very rich. Again, he's making $2 billion a week. I, it's hard to estimate what portion is that from people paying, overpaying for the databases because they're unoptimized when they run RDS. But I, I, I venture to say it, it's, it's a lot. 
Um, we, we've, seen, we've seen this pattern enough. We know that people are, are making this mistake. And that with AutoTune, I've shown that you can use machine learning to, to optimize the configuration of the system um, and make it run better and more efficiently so that you can make the choice of whether to keep the same hardware and just get better performance uh, and, you know, and delay having to increase your instance size or downgrade to a smaller instance size or, or lesser provision IOPS and, and achieve the same performance level. And so at a, a sort of longer term, you know, I've just shown one piece of what AutoTune can do now with now configuration tuning, but there's a bunch of these other uh, techniques. Uh, we can apply the machine learning techniques that we've developed to other facets of database optimization, to database tuning, um, to, you know, to, to help people you know, improve the performance of these systems that are very complex to maintain. So we are offering everyone a free trial of AutoTune. Uh, we have a starter package on our website. So if you sign up, you can tune your first RDS uh, MySQL Postgres database for free in any region, in any availability zone. And by all means, reach out to us on Slack if you have any questions about how to get up and running.